begin, I'd like to ask how many of you um, are here for the first time for a train station talk? Who's never been to a train station talk before? Oh, good, great. Well, welcome. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Conservancy, there's going to be materials at the table back there, and members um, and staff will be there to answer any questions you have. And how many of you are members of the Conservancy? Oh, great. Good. Well, thank you. It's the members who help to support all the uh, wonderful tasks and, and projects that the Conservancy um, carries, carries out, both financially and in person. And I don't know if you know the numbers of what uh, have we've done in the last bit, short bit of time, but in 2000, let's see, 2023, we planted and protected 4,300 shrubs and trees. And since 2020, when all the projects start, thank you, when all the projects started, we now have 35,000 native trees and shrubs that have been planted and protected. And the planting isn't stopping. We're going to start again in the spring. And our goal to plant in 2024 is 10,000 trees. And there are ways you can help. You can donate to the Conservancy. Or if you'd like to have a nice day out in the country with friends and people, come and help us plant. You can sign up on the website. It'll tell you where and how to do that. And uh, you can be part of the great experience of reforesting the, uh, the sour lands. And another way you can help is spreading the word. Tell your friends about the Conservancy. Tell your friends about the talks. Invite them to come and invite them to come and help us. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank the people who are involved in helping to put this on. The Sourland Conservancy staff and volunteers um, do a lot of legwork to get these things uh, up and running. And so I'd like to thank this evening Peggy Ballman and Julie Pertilla. Jackie Perlter, who can't be here today, Sophia Fuentes, who's upstairs in the back overseeing our technology, and Lori Cleveland, who wasn't able to be here today but has been very instrumental in this project. And I'd like to thank Barbara McClintock and the um, um, Titusville First Presbyterian Church for pro providing this wonderful venue for us to use for many of our um, events. If this is your first um, time at the talk, this is how it'll go. We'll have it, I'll introduce our speaker. She'll talk, speak for about 30 to 45 minutes. There'll be a Q&A afterwards, and, um, and then we'll conclude the program. The program, as I said, we're, we're Zooming it. It's also going to be stored on YouTube. So if you want to revisit the, the event or you want to share it with someone who couldn't come, if you go to the Sourland Conservancy YouTube um, webpage, you'll be able to see this talk and other talks that have been uh, put on. And in the next few days after the talk, you'll receive an email, a follow-up email, um, giving you specific information about any of the books or references that were mentioned in the talk. And also it has a survey asking you any ideas you have for future talks or things that we might do that would make the talks um, better for everyone. So when you receive that email, please fill it out and send it back. Our speaker for tonight is um, Jane McKinley, a local, Hopewell, New Jersey, uh, poet, who's going to read and discuss her poems from a sequence that were inspired by her walks in the Sourland Nature Preserve, one of the many different walks um, that are part of the Sourland Conservancy. Um, a basket of walks. That's a terrible metaphor. Group of walks that you can enjoy. And the poem started the day before Sandy, so that'll be 2012, and then follow um, Jane's walks through the, the park um, for a whole year, tracking the seasons, tracking what she saw at the time um, in the in the park. Um, things like the early April flowers, the nuts in the fall, heavy fog in January, and of course the aftermath of Sandy, which was quite dramatic. Each poem will be um, illustrated with photographs from the Sourlands, generously provided by Jim Amon, a former board member of the Sourland Conservancy, and many of his uh, photos are in this book, which we have available at the back at the table if you're interested in seeing more pictures of the Sourlands. And also Yvonne Kuntz, Sharon McGee, and Hoytzen van der Waal provided photographs to illustrate the poems. Um, Jane is a Baroque oboist and the artistic director of the Dryden Ensemble, a professional um, chamber music group that's based in Princeton, New Jersey. 
her life as a poet began in 2003 when she, haunted by an image, took up writing again after a lapse of 30 years. Her poetry collection, her first one, Vanitas, won the 2011 Walt McDonald First Book Prize, and her work has appeared in, or is forthcoming in a number of publications, the Georgia Review, the Southern Review, Five Points, Poetry Daily, Able Muse, and the Baltimore Review. And in 2023, she was awarded a poetry fellowship by the New Jersey Council of the Arts. And this, we this past week, Jane got an email that informed her that the Able Muse Press will publish her poetry manuscript entitled Mud Man, whose main themes are loss and the natural world, and cover poems about her experiences in nature, about her father's experiences during World War II, and elegies for her sister Priscilla and others. This book will be coming out in late spring or summer, so keep your eye open uh, for that. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Jane. Jane. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to thank the Sauerland Conservancy for inviting me to read this evening. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to the program committee, Alexandra Bradville, Peggy Ballman, Sophia Fuentes, and Jackie Perlmutter. I'd also like to thank Jim Amon, Yvonne Kuntz, Sharon McGee, and my husband, Hoytzen Funderall, for their photos. Um, we didn't, well, unfortunately, I didn't have photos of the day after Sandy or, you know, even weeks after Sandy because um, I wasn't thinking ahead and I'm not really a photographer. Um, and I didn't have a good fog poem e or photo either. So in December, one Saturday morning, I looked out the window and it was very foggy. And my husband is usually up pretty early, but he was sort of still dozing in bed. I said, let's go on an adventure. <laughs> it's time to take some fog photos in the Sourlands. Um, Anyway, the committee asked me to say a few words about how these poems came into being. Um, in July of 2012, I had both knees, my knees replaced at the same time. The recovery went really well, but between the pain medication, PT, and overwhelming fatigue, my writing routine was completely disrupted. Strange thing, I discovered I couldn't write poetry while on pain meds. Um, in October, to jump start my writing that year, I decided to take a walk every Sunday in the Sourland Nature Preserve near Hopewell and try to find something during the walk to write about. I chose Sunday, of course, because hunting is prohibited that day, at least during the fall and early winter. Um, my first poetry walk took place on October 28th, the day before Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey. Sandy caused so much destruction that it was weeks before I was able to return. I attempted it once, but the entire parking area was filled with utility trucks. One of the workers said, what are you doing here? And told me I needed to leave at once. Not all of the walks resulted in poems, of course, or I'd have a lot more. Um, and there were many Sundays when I had concerts to perform since I I'm a musician, but I managed to come up with this sequence, and I sort of put it aside until the summer of 2021 when I started sort of going through older poems and revising them um, to, in order to put a second book together. Um, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but only one of the poems you'll hear tonight is in that book. But at some point, I hope to publish a small chat book or something with these Sourland poems. Anyway, walking in the woods always restores me. I grew up in northern Iowa, nine miles from the Minnesota border, zone three in those days. 30 below was quite normal. And I spent much of my childhood roaming the woods that had been in my family since 1855, when my great-great-grandfather bought land the government had taken from the local tribes. Most of this woodland is still unspoiled. It's predominantly white oak and bur oak and bitternut hickory, 
but there are also sugar maples, basswood, white ash, and black walnuts. In the spring, these woods are carpeted with wildflowers. I didn't lay eyes on a beech tree until I went to college in Evanston, Illinois, and I don't remember ever seeing a tulip tree until I moved to this area. Both my parents loved nature, and our family spent many Sunday afternoons in the woods, a perfect way to rid six children of their excess energy. So I think that's enough background. Um, on the Sourland Ridge, October 28th. The woods are still. No sound but the rustle of dry leaves at my feet. Oak, tulip, maple, beech. Boulders slumber, rising from the leaves like hippopotami or burned out jalopies. I used to think they were glacial deposits riding in on the coattails of ice, but these rose up from the core. They split the earth apart by force, seething through its crust, then hardening to monoliths, buried alive before they reached the surface, emerging after years of erosion to populate this ridge. In my mind, I hear the sound of this landscape forming, the gurgle of molten rock, the din of layers shifting, of continents breaking off. But in this calm, I cannot imagine tomorrow's wind, a hurricane landing, uprooting old trees, prying them loose, then letting them go with a thud. I grew up with tornado, wily, erratic, sirens screaming as we ran for shelter. No time to prepare, no stocking the pantry with canned soup or batteries, no boarding up windows, no telling where the funnel would strike. Here, we spend days waiting to be ravaged. I take a long look at these trees, old friends, sitting ducks, as if I were seeing them off the war. December 9th. Among the fallen, young and old, oak, maple, beech, their scattered limbs, the wind did not discriminate. Some giants lie prone, others perch at rakish angles, caught by a fork or suspended in air until earth lets go. One oak leans left at 80 degrees, on its right, woolly with moss, a mammoth boulder sits on its roots. Beside the trail, saplings bow down, as if laden with snow, their twigs intertwined to form bowers above me. A middling tree bends from the waist in an arc resembling many peplia upside downia. Others have snapped into ragged branches. Decades ago, I witnessed the swath a tornado cut on a hillside thick with eminent oaks. Nothing was left but mangled stumps. Here, Many were spared. Why does one tree succumb while the others around it stand firm? And these beech leaves still dangling their bronze, are they hanging by a thread? Fine drizzle turns to rain. Green is everywhere. Moss and lichen, leathery ferns, 
even the old gray boulders have taken on a greenish cast, as if they too were living. Survivors. The world is full of them. December 30th. I thought snow would soften the blow these woods sustained, but each fallen tree is dressed in white, making the carnage visible even from a distance. The angles stand out, black and white, against the vertical thrust of the living, whose trunks sway wildly in this wind dislodging any flakes from their branches. No matter the size of the tree, each trunk's lower third remains grounded, unmoving, the way ballast serves as a counterweight, while the upper two-thirds thrash about. As if these trees were giant hydras, with tentacles flailing in search of food, their feet stuck fast to the rocks below. I stand here, stricken, water flea. Fog, January 13th at 4 p.m. Side by side, we hike up the ridge, careful not to uncouple each other's thoughts. We reach the high point, branching off instead of heading back the way we came, and find ourselves in an old photograph, a monochrome, a monochrome, with hand-colored moss and lichen, beech leaves dangling, steeped in phosphorescent tea. The tree trunks flat as if part of an opera set for Hansel and Gretel. The spaces between them pillowed with silver. The trail is hard to make out. Downed trees and branches keep forcing us to skirt the path. So we rely on white markers nailed to trees or painted on. Darkness keeps unfurling. The fog thickens. We have no breadcrumbs, no flashlights. I think of farmers who froze to death, trudging back to their houses after milking the cows. How they kept going in circles blinded by swirling snow, dying just body lengths from their own back doors. A broken police tape alerts us to a power line ahead, low enough to cut us off at the neck. Ducking under, we scramble over a fallen oak whose stub of a limb rips my left pant leg at the knee missing my incision by an inch. We step with care now, wary of wet spots, grateful for leaves in thick wads like stepping stones across the boggy ground, hearing the rush of last night's rain before we see it, the stream so swollen it could be winter's end. A rattled cry quivers the air, stopping us in our tracks. We've gone too far to turn back now. The light is nearly gone. Water curls up 
around between the mossy rocks, increasing the distance we have to straddle. My titanium knees aren't ready for this, but my goat-footed husband forges ahead, leaping from rock to rock, lurching when he loses his footing, almost falling in. I wait for him to return, to take my hand, to guide me to the other side. We're both teetering now, shifting our feet as if dancing a quick step. Sepia turns to umber, the word itself full of shadow and earth. We stumble upon the main trail as if we'd found a passage to another world. And who's to say it isn't in this fog? From Fjuk, Old Norse for snowstorm, we cannot see the end until we're there. Tulip Trees, February 24th, for my father on his 94th birthday. I want to show you these woods, how in the afternoon, with the sun at my back, each tree is singular, with its own color, form, and texture, its own history of storm and drought. These woods are not familiar. They're full of beech and tulip, species too tender for your landscape. In middle age, before their bark is furrowed, some tulips masquerade as oaks. But if you look up, you can spot them by the dry husks clinging near the top, what's left of their seed cones. The first time I encountered tulip trees, over 35 years ago now, I was struck by their upright nature, how their trunks rarely stray from that straight path the sky, how their flowers, pale yellow flamed orange, bloom only in the upper reaches, as if meant for eyes in the clouds or creatures with wings. These trees will not be overshadowed. Two years ago, one sprouted by our back door. The presumed parent lives down the street. I planned to dig it up and put it in a pot, but it grew so fast that by the following summer, it was towering over me, its roots refusing to give. So my son, worried it might destroy the foundation of our house, hacked away, severing the leader and stripping the side shoots, leaving a thickish stump six inches high. Furious, I snatched up the leaves still intact, specimens in every size, bright green shapes like conjoined mittens, knitted together a thumb on each side, and pressed them between my gardening books and the OED. Last week, I checked on them. There's still that lovely pea-green shade, crisp as new bills. The stump has many suckers now, like stamens surrounding a pistol. I'm waiting for spring, the 37th without you, for a second chance to observe these leaves emerging. Chains of green doors, that keep on opening. Old Mountain. March 5th, 
In late winter, each boulder becomes a separate world, a Chinese landscape of its own. Ancient mountain, rounded, wind-worn, cut off from the others by echoes in strange dialect. On this one, near the summit, are stunted pines and a lake made of lichen, a splash the pale blue-green of melted glacier, its surface rough at the edge, as if a single wave had frozen. A narrow path winds its way up the mountain, arriving at a wide, jutting ledge. Behind it, the rock has folded over itself, forming a pocket, a shelter for birds, or a wandering poet. My eyes rest on a bamboo mat, a jar of wine, a circle of stones charred by fire. It's nearly dusk. The poet is absent, gone off to the lake to fetch water or fish to fry for his evening meal. When he returns, he'll offer you wine, then sing to the moon while you float between heaven and earth, waiting for your ancestors. Don't ask him why he lives up on this mountain. He'll smile as if he didn't hear. Plethora, a condition characterized by the excess of blood or of a bodily humor or of juices in a plant. Oxford English Dictionary. April 25th. Having missed the beginning, that slow rise of blood and sap, the gradual shift to blossoming, this excess is nearly too much to take in. Violet spreading, indigo, lilac, yellow, white, may apples, fiddleheads, Solomon seal, dwarf ginseng's tiny white clusters, whole schools of trout lilies, mottled leaves, swimming with ephemerals, pink veined spring beauties, and fragile rue anemones. The trails cordoned off with poison ivy, seedlings of every sort jousting for space. Strip malls of maple, beech, Japanese barberry, and saplings I mistake for saucer magnolias. I stop to observe their raw red petals. Not flowers at all, but sheaths peeling back allowing the frowning hickory leaves to escape their cramped quarters. Leaflets file out in chain gangs of five, twisted pale shagbarks, pining for light. Solstice, June 20th. A sapling stands out 
leafless in this green profusion, a death that might have gone unnoticed if the sun were not turning the silk of five spiders to silver. They've staked their claim, seeming to know when no one's home, when no one's ever coming back, weaving the space between the dead branches with God's eyes, eyes believed to understand what the physical eye cannot. Surrounded by a cloud of gnats, I step up my pace, attempt to create a no-fly zone. But gnats must sense the carbon in my breath and synchronize their flight with mine, precise as any murmuration. But unlike starlings, they sometimes err. So I barge into them, or they fly into me. Ears, eyes, nose, mouth, they have a bent for openings. This is why I shun the woods in summer, preferring to keep my own company, not that of some tiny winged insects or ticks who enter without buzzing first. I'd have missed this emerald beetle crossing my path, the frog's throaty calls, the pileated woodpecker's whooping cry. As if on cue, a summer azure flutters by, pale blue reversing to silvery white, flitting while the sun stands still. Becoming, early September. White wood asters greet me like old friends, too polite to ask where I've been, happy to see me nonetheless. Or is that going too far? Even the weeds look tired of summer, scrappy encroachments on the path, littered now with hickory nuts in their thick brown husks. I love the way they open, splitting apart at the seams, four nearly identical pieces, parts of a puzzle that defy me to put them together again, as if they had changed in coming apart so their edges no longer match up the way you might change when going to pieces, sloughing off lives like old winter coats, thick layers you once hid behind, curled in a shell of your own design, not knowing it could open. After one year, November 9th, all that remains are browns and grays, the stubborn leaves of beeches and oaks. Without the distraction of color, the destruction is plain. It's clear these fallen trees are recent losses. Bark sticks to their ribs, Shoots sprout from their junctures. The leaves they drop were buds a year ago. They've maintained a connection to earth somehow. A few grounded roots carry food and water. The others greet the sky. 
these dead are no different from ours. They linger on, grasping at life, or lie beneath the surface, offering up secrets long after they're gone. An older corpse, whose roots no longer cling to soil, whose bark slides off its back like so much unwanted skin, is covered with nut-brown growths like uncapped acorns upside down, clustered together to form whole colonies of hangers-on. I wade through brambles and sharp-toothed barbary to get a closer look, kneeling to touch, expecting some small resistance, hard or fleshy, but the small brown orb collapses with a burst of dark smoke. Thank you. One of the 